All right, everybody, welcome back to Getting Sober, da, da, da. Again, my name is Jay, and today we are going over fourth and final installment of our series, questions that people have about sobriety. <laughs> if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing by hitting the subscribe button down below. And at some point, leave this video a big thumbs up and leave a comment for either me or for somebody else in the comment section down below. All right, so this is the fourth and final episode of, or the fourth installment of episode number 120. Each installment has 10 questions. So these are gonna be questions number 31 through 40. And if you haven't yet, please check out the other parts of this very long episode by visiting our main page at youtube.com forward slash getting sober again. All right, let's get started with today's topic, which is questions that people ask when they want to get sober, part four of four. <laughs> so I'll answer the questions for you and uh, we'll go from there and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Don't forget to join us for our live streams every Friday and every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, where we actually talk to each other live in a chat room and we have lots of fun. It's a safe and sober hangout for people to participate and maybe learn about each other. And if you haven't swung by yet, please come by and say hello. I know it doesn't work for everybody's time zones, but it's okay. You can always catch the replay because every single one of the live stream and chats are pre-recorded. All right, let's get started. So question number 31 is, is sobriety as rewarding as you thought it would be? Well, <laughs> a little bit, mostly yes, and a little bit no, um, being completely honest. And again, this channel's, I'm not trying to convince anybody of really anything other than be a good person, and try your best to live a decent and balanced life and take steps closer to being the best version of you that po you can possibly be. That's really what we're trying to do here. And through this particular vehicle, we talk about sobriety, right? And so with regard to sobriety for me, today is actually my 10 month anniversary of being sober, which is my longest streak <laughs> of being sober. And um, and I've done, I've done a bunch of different streaks, but that's why the channel's called Getting Sober, dot, 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 again. But I didn't have the intention of, I, I didn't purposely make the channel and then say like, oh, well, I'll just get sober and then I'll drink whatever I want and I'll get sober. That's not what happened. I intended, when I started this journey <laughs> on November 28th of 2018, I intended to just get sober, and just stay sober and that was it. But of course I'm human and I'm imperfect. And I ended up finding ways along my sober journey that didn't work for me. I found um, temptations that I wasn't necessarily ready to battle and uh, cravings that I let myself give into. And so along the way, we maybe talk about failings. And along the way we talk about messing up or falling off the wagon or whatever it is. But if you took any other journey in life, whether it be by plane, train, or automobile, there would be maybe unexpected surprises. Maybe there'd be a long wait at the baggage terminal. Maybe there'd be a baby crying in front of you. Maybe somebody would be coughing through the entire flight. Maybe somebody's headphones would be too loud. Maybe somebody would be hogging the middle armrest. But you may complain a little bit, but you would still complete your journey. So every journey is gonna have some, some pitfalls and some things that are gonna keep us from having the most perfect journey, but no journey is perfect. So we focus on what's best. We focus on what works for us and what we're getting out of it. And remember to show gratitude or remember occasionally, or as often as we can, to remember where we had come from and where we were just a few months ago or even a few weeks ago or even last night, right? So we try to be grateful and show gratitude and know that we're taking steps in a more positive direction, whether it being that we know that we're eliminating toxicity from our body, we're eliminating poison from our body. So we know that we are going to eventually get healthier. We know that we're not spending so much or wasting so much money. So we know that we're going to have more money saved and more money to do things that we actually care about and love and maybe get back to some of the things that we wanted to do in the first place. Some of the things that some of our hobbies, some of our passions that we kind of just gotten away from because the things that used to bring us joy stopped bringing us joy at a certain point. 
Once maybe we found out or figured out or thought or believed that we weren't gonna go pro or that maybe it wasn't going to be a lifestyle, complete lifestyle change, when we felt like we peaked at a certain hobby or interest, maybe we lost interest. And maybe as we continued to drink more, those hobbies and those interests and those passions maybe got put on the back burner. And one of the things that with this particular question, which is, is sobriety as rewarding as you thought it would be? Um, in a lot of ways, yes, because yeah, my health has improved. My relationship with my friends and my family has improved. My self-confidence has improved. It's reinforce the fact that I am who I thought I was and that I didn't need the crutch of alcohol to be this person. And the anxiety that I'd felt more often and more regularly seemed to dissipate, if not entirely disappear altogether from situations, just from say, going to gatherings or parties or social events where I felt like, oh no, I don't know what to do. How am I supposed to talk to people? I have this new found sense of confidence, which carries me through most situations. And it's highly and easily, I feel like, uh, observable to most people, which makes me feel a lot better. Um, and the ways that maybe I didn't think it was gonna be rewarding is we're always on a mission which is part of what you're doing here and what I'm doing here is we're on a mission to be our best selves, to find ways that we can be better, maybe mentally, right? Physically, spiritually, emotionally, and maybe financially, or maybe romantically, or maybe creatively. We're always trying to make strides to becoming better versions of us. And I always say in other episodes that sobriety alone isn't going to fix everything. If you just decide that you're not going to drink starting now, well, all of a sudden overnight, your credit score is not going to get better. All of a sudden, the next morning when you show up to work, your boss isn't going to be like, my spidey sense has been going off. Is there something different about you? Wait a minute. You're not drinking anymore. You know what? Corner office. It's yours. Raise. Actually, take my job here. Take my parking spot too. <laughs> That's not going to happen, right? So it's strides that we have to make once we start applying the sobriety. Well, we still have a lot of other work to do, right? We still have to mend some maybe broken relationships. Maybe we have to mend some things around the house that we let get a little disgusting and uh, disorderly. So there's still a lot of work to do. And of course, I knew that, but I thought maybe some things would be a little bit easier. <laughs> but that's just wishful thinking. So I always knew that there was going to be work that was going to be involved. And it's work that I can more easily handle now that I'm sober. Now that I have more consistency, more consistency, knowing who I'm going to be when I wake up in the morning, that makes my life and my approach to life and all given situations, good, bad or ugly, <laughs> a lot easier. So I think that there has been uh, there's definitely been it's definitely been rewarding to say the least. And uh, and I highly recommend it <laughs> if you haven't uh, if you haven't started your sobriety yet. We have plenty of videos on starting your sobriety for preparing your sobriety for the anxiety that you may experience or you may uh, you may even just think that you may have. There's a lot of people are just hesitant, hesitant to even start the journey or even start thinking about it. or even just the thought of thinking about it uh, gives them an anxiety because really when it comes down to it is you know that it's going to be work. You know that you had been putting off work every day that you chose to go to happy hour after work. You knew that you were putting off self work. You knew that every time that you went and got blitzed every night to the point where you were just untrustworthy, untrustworthy and unreliable. And you didn't know what version of you was going to wake up in the morning or even if you were going to want to wake up in the morning or if you were going to wake up in the afternoon, actually. That was probably something that you knew was going to happen and I knew it was going to happen. So getting rid of the self-sabotage is delightful <laughs> to say the least. So let's move on to the second question. Are you happier now that you're sober? So one of my goals was to have a more fulfilling life and that's made me happier. Drinking gave me happiness in spikes and then it also gave me sadness in spikes where if we just want to be level, so to speak, and have a more level and consistent daily existence, which I think a lot of you want, right? Because we are all human. I know that because I'm human and I experience these feelings that a lot of people out there also have these feelings. We want more consistency on a daily basis. And we tend to gravitate towards alcohol or anything that maybe we could just feel like we we're pushing that easy button because we knew that when we push alcohol button, dopamine is released in brain. 
and then we push alcohol button and then dopamine is released in brain. We knew that that would happen. And so we'd slap the shit out of that button. <laughs> when, and so we slapped the hell out of that button, right? Until we probably felt like we overused that button. And maybe we feel like, uh, or felt like that a couple of things maybe got short circuited <laughs> along the way, right? But I could definitely say that I am happier now. And I've said recently in our podcast, and I've said before that like my life has surprisingly gotten better. And because my life has gotten better, it's not because I'm broadcasting, you know, like to, to, to be completely honest with you, um, on my personal social media, you know, I have a couple of different accounts. I don't even have uh, a getting sober again social media account yet. I rarely even tell people in my Facebook community or in my Instagram community that like, hey, I'm doing this, I'm on this sober journey or whatever, because I wanted to know in the beginning, which is always my advice to people when you want to start your sobriety journey, just start it. Start it on whatever day, preferably not on a Monday, <laughs> but start on whatever day. It doesn't have to be an anniversary. It doesn't have to be a birthday. It doesn't have to be a death day. It doesn't have to be when, when, when they left me or, you know, it doesn't have to be anything traumatic. Just decide to start to make the attempt and you may fail at some points or you may find a reason to, that you might, you may find a, a certain attempt that doesn't work, right? Instead of calling it a failure. And with regard to my own happiness now, I've often said that this is the happiest in the best time of my entire life. And part of that is because of you. Part of that is because of the live streams we do. Part of that is because of the people that are reaching out to me and saying that because of this decision, decision that I've made to have this channel and have this community, that their lives have been changed. That not only their lives have been changed, but maybe people in their households lives have been changed and people in their communities lives have been changed. And that's part of what we're trying to do here is trying to illuminate the world with positivity, illuminating the world with the possibility that you can be better. Because when we're trapped in the desperation of alcoholism or just heavy drinking, whatever you want to call it, we feel like we're just enveloped and surrounded in darkness. We feel like there isn't going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And when we don't feel like there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, we feel like, well, what's the point of attempting to get into the light or to step into the light or try to even get to the end of the tunnel if I don't even believe that it's possible. I don't even believe that there is an end to this tunnel. I feel like I'm just here and this is where I'm going to lie and this is gonna be the end of my existence. And some of those dark thoughts absolutely go through people's brains. And that was a, those were definitely thoughts that I had during my existence. So I know that now I don't have the crazy slappable spike of dopamine happening on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis, because obviously I'm not drinking. But that level where I'd always felt like at best, I was always kind of just a little under, a little bit under par, so to speak. If this is what we feel like we should, where we should be for like normal, normal feelings, normal happiness, normal sadness, instead of spiking with happiness and then going into the gutter with depression, I definitely feel like I'm a lot closer. I'm the closest that I've ever been since maybe I was a young, innocent child unaffected by society and rules and education and jobs and bills and things like that. But this is the closest period of my life um, to having more wholesome, feelings, to being more joyful, to having more opportunities and expressing more opportunities to uh, show gratitude for everything that I have and everything that I am and all the ways that I have improved mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and also too coincidentally, financially, right? All right. So moving on to question number 33, how do you deal with boredom during sobriety? <laughs> the thing that uh, I, the thing I love saying, and please quote me on this, is the only thing that you can't do when you're sober is get drunk. <laughs> That's it. You can literally do everything else, well, except for drink too, right? But you can literally do everything else. And it's actually most advisable that you do everything when you're sober, like operate a, a motor vehicle, right? <laughs> or a boat or a plane or train or whatever else, any other heavy, heavy machinery. <laughs> so I, I always tell people, I always advise people like, hey, don't forget to look within. 
You know, there's whenever you have that anxiety, whenever you feel like there's that boredom, whenever you feel like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do now? Like, oh, now I'm sober and like the time is just going by. I thought they said that there's 24 hours in a day, but it feels like there's 48 or maybe even 72 hours in a day. I don't know. I think I'm just going to cave in. I'm just going to drink. And yeah, I know me too. I felt like that too, especially in the beginning. It's like, how long is today? It's only 5.30 <laughs> because normally at 5.30, well, for some of us, 5.30, we'd already be at the bar. We'd already clocked out. The bar is half an hour, you know, or whatever it is from, from wherever you work. And you're already sitting down. You're already getting happy hour prices and you're already well on your way to building up your appetite towards dinner and uh, getting yourself home with a nice glassy eyed buzz and then maybe sitting down for dinner and then, hey, uh, stop by the gas station on the way home, grab myself a six pack of beer and then I'm gonna have some of those beers with dinner or whatever, you know, or a bottle of wine or whatever you, whatever your poison was, right? So how do I deal with boredom is all of those thoughts that I had been putting off, all of those things that I felt like all those ideas I was being gifted by God or the universe or whoever, or just past experiences, whatever it is, maybe YouTube ads, who knows what it was. These All these ideas were planted in my head for the ambitions that I have. And maybe you're saying, but Jay, I don't have any ambitions. Well, guess what? You're gonna have a whole bunch of free time on your hands to develop some new ambitions to maybe grab a couple new hobbies, or maybe even just watching a couple new YouTube videos like this one, or any of the other 160 videos that we have here. And maybe get some ideas on how to not only just strengthen yourself in your sobriety, but also the goal, that's just the first stop. I mean, it could be the end stop for you is just to get yourself sober and then ride off into the sober sunset with who who knows what's gonna happen. But maybe, you're, maybe your goal is just to be sober and just for maybe your significant other to love you a little bit more or to not resent you so much, or maybe to attract an ideal partner that isn't somebody that's just always hanging out at the bar and crazy back alleys or somebody that's always, that's also, or always was or is or whatever, toxic all the time. You know, when we come from, let's say if you come from a toxic household, if you come from say a, a single parent household and a lower income household, I'm not speaking for anybody and I'm not generalizing. I'm, I am generalizing a little bit. Um, but the point is, if you come from say a lower income single parent household, you will potentially, there's a higher percentage chance that you're gonna gravitate towards a potential partner, a spouse, a dating person, a dating partner, whoever, that maybe also comes from a similar set of credentials, right? You may not come, if you come from a very religious household, you may not feel entirely comfortable hanging out with somebody who is has no relationship with God and their parents are, you know, into total, into secular music and um, in popular culture and movies and things like that. And though you may be interested because it's forbidden fruit, but my point is you gravitate towards what you know. And if you knew, all you knew was toxic behaviors, then you're gonna gravitate towards old familiar people, old familiar places because that's what you're used to. And unfortunately, people gravitate towards what they're used to, even though what they're used to is toxic. Dealing with my boredom during sobriety is, I know that now I don't have to feel so rushed. Not only am I waking up way earlier, which is affording me more time during the day to do more things, but now I don't have to feel so rushed. So like saying like, terrible scenarios where I was waking up at like noon and then going to the bar at five o'clock and then being completely annihilated drunk by 12, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. Some of my days were only like 12 hours long sometimes. And then the whole rest of the time I was in recovery sleep and I would wake, I'd go to sleep, you know, and of course wake up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom and all that stuff and then wake up a little bit later and then go to the, maybe go to the bathroom again and then, you know, have my anxiety wake ups and then go back to sleep. And then I wake up, maybe have breakfast and I just wasn't feeling good. And I just, I'd eat a little bit of breakfast and I wouldn't feel good after breakfast. And maybe I'd have to lay back down after breakfast, but that's not happening anymore. Now I wake up and sometimes I'm like, uh, I'm shocked and appalled by how little sleep I got because I want a little bit more time to just be in silence. <laughs> and I, you know, sometimes now I'm getting to the point where I'm sleeping like five and a half, six, six and a half hours a night. 
And though I'm not always the most enthusiastic about starting the day and tackling the day, I know now that if I'm only sleeping, say six hours, then that gives me 18 hours throughout the day to do things like just take a nap, take a stress nap. Is, is my to-do list a little too long? Probably, let me just, let me just take a nap. Let me fit in that bike ride. Let me build up those natural endorphins and release a little bit of dopamine naturally. Let myself have the space and the freedom and the extra time to move a little slower, to eat my breakfast with a little bit more intention instead of rushing and giving myself a bellyache, giving myself the time to sit down with your comments and respond to your comments, giving myself the time to take care of the house and not getting stressed out about all these little things that I used to just put off because, oh, what do I wanna do? Do I wanna mop the floors or do I, do I wanna get drunk? And part of me still says like, well, let's get drunk, <laughs> let's get drunk. <laughs> but I'm not doing that anymore, obviously. And I find it more rewarding to be able to maintain all that I have. And that's also part of the sobriety journey is that we're not just getting sober, but we're maintaining our sobriety. It's just like any kind of wealth or any kind of health. If you get to a certain place with your health and you feel start to feel healthy, then you want to maintain that health. If you had little to no money for most of your life, and then you start to earn more money and you start to become a little bit more wealthy than maybe you were previously, maybe you're still making five figures a year like me, but maybe you have more pride in maintaining that amount of money, right? So boredom for me is a non-issue. Is it still capable? Am I still capable of being bored? Yeah, there's still some times where I'm like, oh, my options are okay. Like, it's just all chores, but I try to make it fun, right? So we are adults. We don't have to be entertained all the time. Our meals don't have to entertain us, right? We don't always have to sit down and be absorbed with the newest thing that's coming out on Netflix or the newest movie or the newest album or he said or she said or the tabloids or whatever else the media is putting out there for us to consume. Maybe it's time for some of us to turn on our inner creator and make content for others to consume. And if you're not sure how to do all that, there are plenty of tutorials out there for you to learn new skills, new hobbies, and start to fall in love with yourself again. And that should definitely be one of the things that you wanna accomplish on your way during your sobriety journey. All right, moving on to question Number 34, are your feelings more or less intense now that you're sober? <laughs> I think that, um, well, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of feelings where I just didn't really know how to deal with them. I didn't know if I didn't know if I had the proper tools. I didn't, nobody wants to deal with heartbreak. Nobody wants to deal with rejection. Nobody wants to finally build up the courage to ask somebody out on a date and then they say no. But then even not even not even like even worse than them saying no, but they said no. And then other person, other people heard them say no. And then now you have a record of not only just one person rejecting you, but then you have this multiple records of people uh, of you getting rejected, right? My feelings now after the first couple of months definitely became a little bit more intense, but it's feeling is across the board. It's happiness. It's sadness. It's joy, it's guilt, it's jealousy, whatever it is. But now, because we have more time in the day, we have more time to do the self work that we've been avoiding. Because every time that we get a feeling and maybe we're just like, I don't really know how I wanna deal with this, then bam, you're drinking again. And you're just like, let's just, uh, let's just let anger take care of that one again, right? And we mismanage our emotions time after time after time. And more often than not, they become the extreme of the emotions, like extreme joy or extreme sadness or anger or depression, right? And then trying to ride that roller coaster of emotions somewhere through the zone of the middle was something that we thought that we could do. We could take a little something to go down, we can take a little something to go up, a little something to go down, a little something to get back to the middle, I hope, and something a little, a little something to get to bed because, you know, that's why I can't sleep without my drinks, you know that. But we have all these coping mechanisms, we have all these excuses to enable ourselves, just like other people do, to participate in toxic behaviors. So now that we have this extra time, to 
observe the feelings, we can start to ask more questions because we weren't asking any questions. When we were drinking, we just knew, oh, here, here comes, uh oh, feeling alert, feeling alert, feeling alert, don't worry, dispatch alcohol, dispatching alcohol. And then that would be it. And then we'd have alcohol, we'd numb the pain. And what we wanted to happen was alcohol, make me happier make this whole situation a more pleasurable experience. But then also too, part of that deal, part of that small print, which is this page, the page is this long, you know, when you're, when you're downloading that new app and it's like, you have to agree to the terms and you look at the terms, you're just like, oh my God, it's this big. And nobody ever reads the terms. And the terms and the conditions of drinking alcohol is, is gonna, it's potentially gonna, uh, it's, <laughs> it's potentially going to cause hopelessness. It's potentially gonna cause desperation. It's gonna, it's gonna cause depression. It's gonna cause anxiety. It's gonna cause a whole bunch of negative feelings too, just for that chance, just for that chance to maybe feel happiness or more pleasure in your life. So now that we have the extra time, we can sit with these feelings and observe them and see and wonder and ask why this is happening. And if this is happening again, is this a repeat pattern that we should start to nip in the bud. So should we start to know when we can expect examples of gaslighting or toxic behaviors from coworkers or friends that maybe, you know what? Uh, maybe we should just get rid of these people. Some of these people in our life, just because we've known people our whole life doesn't mean that we need to know them for the rest of our lives. And that's so catchy, I'm gonna say it twice. Just because we've known people our whole lives doesn't mean that we need to know them for the rest of our lives. All right, moving on to question number 35. How do you party or have a good time sober? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on what you mean by party. Um, I think most people nowadays, when they talk about uh, party, party is a loose term for uh, overindulging in some sort of substance. But uh, so obviously I'm not doing that anymore. But um, if we're just going to talk about it in a more innocent, uh, in an innocent, more innocent phrasing, um, party, going to a party, maybe uh, being in a, in a celebratory fashion with other people, right? Uh, a gathering of sorts. And how do I have a good time sober? I get to practice more being myself. And that's what we talk about in one of our previous episodes. We talk about practicing your sobriety. So part of practicing your sobriety isn't just practicing going, oh, no, 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 oh, crisis avoided, no, no, I said no. That's not what practicing sobriety means. <laughs> practicing sobriety means obviously not going to the gas station and getting other things other than gas. Just get the gas. <laughs> going to the gas or going to the, the grocery store and going past aisle three and then just going past aisle three because aisle three is where all of the wine and the beer is, right? So practicing sobriety is maybe we're gonna go to a concert. We're gonna try going to a concert for the first time. I mean, our last time and every other single time that we've been to this concert venue, we've been really, 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 really drunk. <laughs> and you have to practice being there and just enjoying the show. Just practice just being entertained by entertainment and not having to get drunk also with your entertainment, right? Just practice being at your kid's birthday party and not getting shit faced during your kid's birthday party and just being present and just practicing just loving that person and just loving the people around you. And practice all the times where you didn't know what to do with your hands because you had a phone in one hand and you maybe had a beer bottle or a cocktail in the other one and you kind of just hid behind your shield of like, well, I don't know what to say, so I'll have a drink and uh, well, I'll, still, I don't know, I'll, check, I'll check my phone. I don't really know what to say to anybody else. You get to practice talking to other human beings again. <laughs> you get to practice doing a whole bunch of other things that you just maybe plugged in the silence with having a drink and avoiding social growth and avoiding personal growth. So how do I have a good time? How do I party? <laughs> how do I have a good time? I just go. Um, now I'm still, I'm not putting myself in situations like obviously I, and maybe we all hung out at a lot of bars. A lot of my friends were bar friends. Most of the associates, not even gonna call a lot of these people friends. They're just associates. People just I know around town mostly from being at bars, right? Most people recognize me. Uh, most of the places that I go to are bars. Like, and of course, I'll, I'll go to the occasional botanical garden or the library, you know, or whatever it is, or the park. And then I'll see some people from around town. And, um, but for the most part, most of the people that I know and I see and I recognize, I know and I see and recognize because 
we've been at a bar together or we've been at a party together or whatever, or we, we were in the service industry together, which is pretty much the same thing, right? So when I go to these places, when I go to gatherings, um, I was recently at a, at a big uh, family get together uh, a couple of months ago and everybody was drinking except for me. And had I not been drinking that night, somebody I could definitely, and multiple people could attest to this, somebody would have died in a car accident had I not taken the keys from this person, insisting on driving this person and tricking them by making them believe that we we're going on this, uh, on this adventure that they wanted to go on, when really all I did was drive until they passed out and then I drove back to the house <laughs> and I left them <laughs> I left them with the windows rolled down and uh, parked in the street until they eventually came to, which wasn't until the next morning, but that's entirely on them, right? But uh, so having fun, like it, it's fun to be able to be present. It's fun to be able to remember people's names now and then apologizing to people and being like, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but I'm going to make an effort to remember your name now. I literally just said that to somebody yesterday because I know I wasn't fully present. I was there and alcohol made me feel like I wanted to be at some of these places, but some of the places that I was putting myself into were toxic places. So some of these concert venues, I'm just not going back to anymore unless I really just like the music. I don't need to be distracted. And ask yourself that question, do you really need to be distracted or you just wanna be distracted because you don't wanna have to be more responsible in life. And that's a category that a lot of people fit in. You think like, I went to, I worked, I went to work today, I did my job, I don't wanna do anything else. I don't wanna be held accountable for anything else. I don't have to be, I don't have a boss again until tomorrow morning and let's just keep it that way. And you too, voice in my head, we're not doing any of that stuff. And it's, be quiet, ambition. Yeah, all right. So we're gonna go to this party and we're gonna have a good time. And that's the end of it, right? So that's kind of how a lot of people are. They don't wanna, they don't wanna even just tidy up around the house or clean their car out or just basic stuff. And I always say to myself, like, how can I expect more out of life if I can't even just handle the little things? If I can't just keep my desk space clean and my bedroom organized and my closet clean and my shoes tidy, you know, just simple things like that. I'm gonna ask for bigger and better things. I'm gonna ask for like a bigger and a better channel and to be able to be a better service to other people. And it's like, but I'm not taking care of myself first. So I always tell people, if you're gonna be, if you're interested in working on other people externally, make sure you're doing the work here first. Because one of the interesting phenomenons is when people are giving advice to other people, but they're not doing the work to help themselves. It's a practice what you preach scenario. There are some people that say, uh, do as I say, not as I do, right? So we wanna make sure that we're our best selves. And also too, the added incentive of being a better representative of sobriety is that you may also inspire other people to be sober too. Not by preaching, but just showing them like, you know, I didn't think that you can go to a party and have a good time. But here this whole time, you've just been here, you've been present, your eyes haven't gotten glassier, you're just, you're still speaking clearly and fluently. And I'm having, it seems like you're having a good time. You're inspiring me to maybe also, what were we talking about again? I'm a little drunk. So be a good representative for sobriety and maybe you'll help to recruit some other people too. All right, moving on to question number 36. How do you cope with painful emotions? Very simply, better decisions lead to better emotions. And in the past, I know for me, and I know for you too, that we were making a lot of worse decisions. I don't, you know, you maybe notice that I don't say good decisions or bad decisions. There's just, there are better decisions and there are worse decisions, right? And um, when we start to get in the rhythm of sobriety, we're still gonna be struggling with the, the devil on our shoulder and the angel on the so shoulder situation, but all the while, it's just us. All the while, it's the yin, the yang, the masculine, the feminine, whatever we wanna talk about, but it's still us right? This, the devil still wants to dance whether or not you drink. And we have to find new ways to entertain that mischievous side of us. And I'm not saying that we have to indulge in negative or, or in self-sabotaging ways, but we do need to be mindful that there is no lightness without dark, right? Or there's no dark without light. We have to know that there's going to be days where not everything's going to go perfectly. Not everything's going to go smoothly. 
that even though you wore your Fitbit to bed and your Fitbit said that you got a good amount of sleep last night, you got a really good sleep score or whatever, and you did everything perfect on paper and your relationship with whoever you have to choose to have a relationship with is good and your bills are paid and you're, in, in your, and you're employed well enough to consider extracurricular things like perhaps a vacation or perhaps a new laptop or perhaps a new car or a better car or a better house or a better vacation, whatever it is, you get to indulge and treat yourself. And one of those things that we get to do is we get to indulge dancing with the devil in some of those ways, because what we were doing previously by making worse decisions was we were just taking vacations that we couldn't afford, right? We were taking from the savings of our life force by borrowing from tomorrow's happiness by drinking today. We were doing that to ourselves. We were borrowing from our own future by poisoning ourselves. And then not only that, it's just that the other bad part about that is we had previously worked in the past to earn the money, okay? So past us, slaved away at this job that maybe we liked or maybe we didn't like, but either way, we had to give our life in the past to get that money. And then us presently decided to drink. We took that money from the past and we spent it currently, which ended up poisoning and sabotaging then our future self. It's like three different dimensions of self-sabotage. We borrowed from our life experience from the past and the money that we had in the current moment, and then it ended up robbing us of our actual life force with maybe say a headache, a hangover, maybe having to call in sick, maybe missing even more work and not being our best self. So answering the question, going towards uh, how do you cope with painful emotions? It literally comes down to, for me, is making better decisions. So better decisions lead to better emotions. And as we get further and further away from the shores of intoxication, and we get further and further away from all those bridges that we burned and all those red flags of our very recent past, it gets further away and further away. And it doesn't mean that they go away. You know, some people maybe take the mentality just like, oh man, I've left a lot. I left the trail of destruction behind me. Um, and I don't know that I can even really change it. So I just need to move entirely and hope to make some new friends. That may have to be a strategy for some of you. If you're in your later years and you live in a small town and all 200 people that live in that town know what you did last New Year's Eve and last Thanksgiving and during the kids and during the kids baseball game that one summer, you all remember, you all remember that one summer, right? You might not be able to get away from your past, but also too, you get to practice making men's. You get to practice choosing better habits. You get to practice writing pages for your future story to prove the people wrong. People may still, and they're still entitled to say whatever they want to say, right? Especially if you live in a free country, they're still entitled to say, and they still, or they still can say whatever they want to say about you in a negative way. But as I always like to say, let's give them something to talk about. Let's give them something positive to talk about. If they choose to continue chasing after a ghost version of you that no longer exists, that's entirely up to them. And that's a reflection of the standards that they have and what they hope that you would continue to be. Because maybe in that sense, it makes them feel good that they could just be a little bit higher. They could be a little bit better than that low bar that you set for yourself. But once you start to set a higher bar, you are breaking yourself free of the opinions and the voices of the people that maybe want to talk and say negative things about you. So the painful emotions, I know I'm leaving them in the past. Now, some of you may be dealing with traumas. I understand. Maybe some of you had some physical traumas or some mental traumas or a combination of the two, maybe some verbal traumas. And I can't speak for all of your individual instances or life experiences. And I know that for me personally, and from a lot of the people that I've talked to in this community, in the comment section, in the live chats, that you start to develop less toxic responses 
to what has happened to you and you start to develop more opportunities to cope with and handle situations that may have previously been affecting you. Now you have a little bit more money to do things like say, go to therapy for the first time or maybe find a better therapist. You get to start asking better questions to more qualified people. You start to find more answers because you're asking more questions because you're more present because you have more time. So know that things are going to get better and that anything that's currently continuing to cause pain and trauma in your life or negative emotions, you now have more time and more strength and more courage and you'll have less anxiety and less depression to handle those people, places or things that may be causing negative emotions in your life. All right, moving on to question number 37. Question 37 was, did you find yourself judging others who drank? <laughs> so did I find myself judging others who drank? Um, no, you know, I, I always tell people, I'll, you know, I'll tell you right now, if you're still drinking and you're watching this channel, um, I expect that to be the case for a lot of people. I do polls a lot of times in our live streams, which is why I say come by to one of our live streams every Friday night and Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. And we conduct polls. It's a really fun time. We ask people questions and you get to see how other people are. And one of the questions I asked um, in the community tab just last week, uh, click on go to our main page, youtube.com forward slash getting sober again. Um, you had to get there to be watching this video, right? Um, so there are four tabs. The first, the first page that you see is the uh, is the, I think the home page, the videos tab, or whatever it is. And then, uh, but the fourth page over, or the fourth tab over, I'm trying to look at it right now. It's uh, the community tab. So in the community tab, that's where I post, hey, what time this we're going live on this time and this day, or here's the link for the last episode, or here's an inspirational quote that we came up with. Um, and one of the things I did there is I also conduct polls. And one of the recent polls, let me see if I can find it for us. I talked, um, I asked people, um, how long have you been sober? And surprisingly, I guess not surprisingly, but um, the, num the most common answer, pardon me while I look at it. So the question was, how long have you been sober? The answers were one to seven days, seven to 30 days, one to three months, three to six months, or six or more months. So there were six answers. There were 200 votes on this uh, poll, and I'll put it up here on the screen if I remember, but the number one answer by far was one to seven days. That's how long you've been sober. And so I know that when you're in the beginning stages of sobriety, that the thing that you want is to finally have that breakthrough. And that's what I'm looking forward for you. I'm looking forward for you to have a life where you break free of drugs and whatever addictions that you may have um, for alcohol, drugs and addiction, whatever, um, so that you can live a full and more balanced life, right? And I would hope that someday you won't be coming back. I mean, you'll come back maybe periodically, but that you're not using this new resource, just like maybe you used alcohol and then you switch from using alcohol to using this channel or other channels to help propel yourself and project yourself into a better version of yourself, to start taking steps in a completely different direction, right? So me judging others, no, because I was also that person. I think that would be highly hypocritical of me. The only people that I judge, that I, I feel a tendency to uh, judge, are the people that don't seem to be actually interested in helping themselves. And they want to cry a river, they want to get attention in the only way that they've ever really known how, which is to project, woe is me. And this happened to me and because this happened to me, I want your, please give me your sympathy. And it's like they, I call them energy vampires. And these people tend to gravitate towards just whoever will listen. You know, taking advantage of people that may be uh, empathetic of the situation and uh, finding new victims to suck energy from. It's like, oh, there's a new victim. I haven't told them my story yet. I haven't told them about my, about my traumas yet. And those are the people that I tend to judge because I'll still see them at the bar. I still see 
this, the typical people, I still see the one person that's always crying out the back ramp. I always see the one guy who, or, or the one, I'm sorry, the one person who is always telling his story about uh, the, the childhood trauma from um, his mom and how he didn't fit in in school and things like that. And those things are, ne those things are never gonna change. But what is gonna change is how you handle today. And for, for, some, for a lot of people, it's just get through today. However you have to get through today, just get through today sober. And after you've been sober for a few consecutive days, guess what thought's gonna pop up in your head? Oh, I feel better. You know what, maybe, you know what? I, I'm not so worried about it anymore. You know, my, I think my body's healing. Maybe it wasn't so bad after all. You know, maybe I can have a drink. Maybe I can find a better balance with alcohol. And then guess what? And then, you're not here at the channel anymore. You're not coming to the live streams anymore because you have a three, you had a three day bender weekends. It happens every day. Somebody comments on this channel and talks about like, I was doing so good. I was five months sober. And then I drank, I drank for three days straight. I went to, I went to a wedding or I went to a party or I get together. Or I hadn't seen my family in so long. And I know what happens. I know what happens when we drink is we have that dopamine release and then we want to have a bigger dopamine release and we have we want to have another one and we want to have another one. And then tomorrow comes and we're like, Oh, well, it's all good intentions. We'll just drink today and we'll just leave it today and we'll put a little asterisk on our record. And then what ends up, what ends up happening tomorrow? Well, like some more friends are getting together and you still got booze in your system a little bit. And then you're just gonna be on like, you know, I don't know, I'm kind of hungover. I, you know, I know that like the cure is I'll have a little, I'll have, have a little hair of the dog. And you start bargaining with yourself to make toxic decisions again. So don't do that because you know what's gonna happen. And you have to be accountable for your actions and your decisions. But if you're gonna have a detour, Again, that's why I'm not judging. If you're gonna have a detour, make a short one, get your act together, get your rest, and get back on the road to recovery. So do I find myself judging other people who drank? No, and I, I mean, I still don't. I just, like I said, it's just, the, it's just the people that highly abuse alcohol or dot, 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 whatever, so that they can be as far removed from themselves as possible, all the while stealing the energy and the life of others who are uh, who seemingly have a better grasp and a better handle on their life, that's and th that show no signs of actually wanting to improve. Other, anything other than their ability to get sympathy from other people, right? So those are the people that I judge. And that's a personal thing, you know, that's just me. It's a, it's a pet peeve of mine, right? Help me help you. But, uh, you know, that also happens in the channel too. Sometimes people will come into the channel and they'll come into the live streams and live chats and then they'll just like hijack the whole live stream or the live chat with uh, their story. And then we've got 30 people wanting to chat and have a good time. And then we have one person who is just like, I don't know what to do, I'm drinking right now. And, you know, and, and it's like, and we love to be of service, but unfortunately then we have two people that are coming to the rescue of this one person in a situation where there's 30 people in the chat room and then now we've got 27 people that are sitting around awkwardly not knowing what to do or what to say or get to celebrate their own successes or their own victories so that's a personal decision of mine that's just personally how i feel but some some people have more empathy than others some people show more sympathy and some people are more uh better balanced and uh know how to handle situation uh situations like that so i'm also still learning so i'm being patient with myself along my sobriety journey, which is part of the three P's. And I think we're gonna add a fourth P in there. The first P of sobriety is the preparation for sobriety. The second P is practicing sobriety. The third P of sobriety is being patient with your sobriety journey. And the fourth one that I may add in the future, which is something that I don't know why I didn't add, I'm gonna make it four P's, but the fourth P is persistence. You get up, you have to be persistent, persistent, Persistence pays off, right? With anything, with trying to get that promotion, trying to uh, convince somebody to go on a date with you <laughs> for the first time, maybe trying to get your credit limit increased, whatever it is, there's so many situations and bargaining tables of life that if we're persistent enough, chances are the opposing party is gonna cave in. <laughs> and in this situation, it's uh, it's alcohol, right? We want, we want alcohol and our addiction to alcohol just cave in because eventually, we're just going to keep working at being sober and that if that's what our goal is to live a sober life, which again, sobriety is not a destination. It is not a task. It is a journey. That's right. Okay. Question number 38. I want to get sober, but my pow my part, <laughs> I want to get sober, but my spouse slash partner still drinks. What do I do? 
in that situation, you know, really, I, I always say that the most important relationship that you're ever going to be in is the relationship that you're in with yourself. You came into this world in this vehicle, whatever you are, whether we're going to call yourself a soul or if we're going to call yourself energy, whatever you are, you are traveling in your vehicle and you go to bed in that vehicle and you wake up in that vehicle, you're birthed into that vehicle and you will eventually die in that vehicle. And nobody else is tied to your central nervous system. Nobody else is really going to feel what you're feeling when you are feeling it. So every emotion that you have, good, bad, or otherwise, is very, very real to you and not to be minimized. And it's almost, you can, all, you can also argue that it's that what, how you feel and what you feel is everything. And it's one of the many, many blessings of being able to be alive is to have these feelings that we had spent so much time suppressing with alcohol and addictions, right? So when it comes down to, I want to get sober, but my partner or my spouse maybe doesn't want to, what do I do? Well, again, the most important relationship is the one that you have with yourself. So you have to do what you have to do for yourself. And I know that's not, that's just general advice, right? And some people are going to say like, well, I've had this part. I've been with, I've been married for 30 years. We have three kids together. We have two, we have a house, we have a vacation house, we have three cars, we have a boat, whatever else, whatever you have. And you talk, start talking about all these things that you have together. But if none of those things are bringing you happiness, you still have to do what you have to do for yourself. And also too, if it's a, if it's a, the institution of marriage that we're talking about till death do you part, then also too, for better or for worse, you have to make compromises, just like any relationship. If it's a work relationship, uh, you know, if it's work, business, if it's friends, if it's a romantic partner, life is all about compromises. Of course, we want to have it all our way, but if we got everything that we wanted all the time, that would be boring. And you might say like, yeah, you want to bet? Yeah, I do want to bet. It would be definitely boring. If it was all sweet without sour, what would sweet be? If it was all good without the bad, what would good be? If it was all bright and sunshiny days, then what would bright and sunshiny days be with anything that was potentially the opposite of it? Sometimes it takes a cloudy day to appreciate a string of sunny days, or it takes a string of cloudy days to appreciate that one spot of the day where the sun comes out and you're just like, oh, I'm gonna get outside, get some, get some sun on my neck, whatever it is. You know, you have to appreciate what you can get sometimes when you can get it. And sometimes it's not always sunshine and roses. And when we have a goal for ourselves, we know that misery, misery loves company. And you have to also be mindful of the fact that a lot of people don't wanna change especially when they're convinced that they found a formula that works for them or even just a formula that works. You know, you get used to that old TV and the remote and the one button that the mute button doesn't work anymore. And you're just like, well, how often do I use a mute button anyway? And you, you kind of get used to it and you know where everything is and you know, like, you know, which buttons to push at what time is right and how it works and when it works. And just like a relationship, you know what buttons to push to get what you want to make. And then sometimes, you know, you know, the mute button is never going to work in that relationship, but you still keep doing it anyway because you get comfortable. And one of the things about growth is growth is rarely comfortable. I'm going to say it again. Growth is rarely comfortable. We are changing. Things are changing. That's part of the definition of growth is that something is going to change for better or worse, right? And as we continue to get bigger, to get better, to get stronger, faster, more healthy, whatever it is, we can't always expect the people that even that we're married to or just in a casual relationship are going to make those decisions for themselves because, A, maybe they have a better balance and maybe they don't see drinking as a problem. And maybe they're not as sensitive to your situations as possible, which is why open communication is going to have to be a new thing that you're going to be practicing and not getting frustrated because it's going to be really frustrating if you're saying to yourself, I want to get sober and it's really detrimental to my success that you keep a bottle of vodka in the freezer or that we keep all these bottles of wine here. And it's not also their fault though, but if they're going to continue to abuse alcohol, you can't expect them to want to change. So will it be harder? Potentially, yeah, it will be potentially harder for you to get sober 
and to be sober and stay sober. So look to sober friends that you may have. Maybe look to AA meetings. Maybe look to other communities where you can talk to people that may have been in the same situation before. All right, moving on to question number 39. How can I bring up to somebody I care about that they may have a drinking problem? So this is definitely a very slippery slope and it's gonna be case by case, you know, and it's gonna be results may vary. And you really have to know the person that you're gonna present this proposal to, right? I always like to tell people I think that one of the one of the best pieces of advice that I can give to people is again being the change that you want to be in the world, right? So that the Gandhi quote, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And when we talk about getting sober, we also talk about not preaching sobriety, right? Or telling people like you need to get sober, you need to shape up or shape out or whatever cuz you also have to remember what how would you feel if somebody told you all of a sudden, like, you got to do this or you got to do that or, you know, you have to do this or else. And it's just like, well, no, I just have to do this or else then, I guess. So I'm presented with two bad opportunities. I'm presented with two options that I really don't want to do this one or that one. So I guess I'll do this one because if not, then the, uh, there's other con consequences that I really don't want to deal with. So I always talk about like when you're getting sober and you become a better representative for sobriety. Right? When we become a better representative for sobriety, we start to inspire people around us. We start to show people benefits of sobriety, like that our skin looks better, that our eyes are less baggy or less puffy or that they're less red or that they're less glassy. We're starting to save more money. Maybe we're doing better and funner things like taking better vacations or more vacations or maybe getting to take some more time off work or maybe starting to entertain the idea of not being an employee and being self-employed. Things like that that were out of our grasp because we didn't have the time, the money, the resources, the emotional stability, whatever the case may be. And once we start to make these changes in our lives, people might, they'll say, well, I know you and well, if you can do it, I don't think by nature, people don't want to think like, well, you're better than me. And then people are also competitive, right? So you may in a way, because somebody's competitive, you may inspire them or because you just happen to be radiating this vibrancy that is attracting them to sobriety. That's why I talk about, I always hope that with sobriety, I hope that your light shines brightly so that you may attract people to the blessings that you have, right? Because they're also looking for those same blessings. And when they start to see that it's possible because they know you, that maybe you're not a motivational speaker, that you're not some, uh, some sober expert or that you just have some YouTube channel or whatever it is, whatever people want to label you, you don't seem so far out of grasp. And people also maybe want to tend to word of mouth suggestions or somebody that they know before taking bigger steps like going to an AA meeting or going to um, a healthcare professional or getting therapy or whatever the case may be. They feel like if they can keep it in their own zone of comfortability, then maybe they can handle it on their own and find a method that works for them that they can feel like they owned, that they did on their own. And that's also part of why I tell and I ask people, if you could pretty please consider sharing these videos with other people that you maybe think might benefit from sobriety. And that's also part of this question is like, how do I bring up to somebody that I care about that they may have a drinking problem? And please feel free to share some of these videos. It brings me great joy knowing that People are out there sharing these videos. It makes me really happy when somebody emails me and says, I, I, I'm starting to see and realize and feel and experience the benefits of sobriety. And I start sharing, I start telling my neighbors or my Facebook community or my next door community or people on Twitter or Reddit or wherever on a blog post at my AA meetings about your channel. And I invited them over to live streams and live chats. That makes me really happy to know that what we're doing here is worth sharing. 
And if you think that sobriety is worth sharing, the thing I'll ask you to do is just try your best to be a great representative of the mission of sobriety. Regardless of what we're doing here at Getting Sober Again or whatever your favorite YouTubers on sobriety are talking about or any other other books that you read, just being a great representative for sobriety and just being the best version of yourself that you could possibly be. And know that it may be a touchy subject and know that you have to come from a place for, of empathy and kindness and compassion and consideration and know that when you put a wild animal in the corner, they may want to claw their way out. So maybe don't put them in a the corner, right? Maybe don't put any unnecessary pressure on anybody, especially too. like it may not be covered. It might it may not be a thought in their head. They may not be considering getting sober. Know that maybe it's not something they even want to do. And they weren't thinking about changing their habits. They weren't thinking about changing their way home. They weren't thinking about giving up or even cutting down on drinking. So know that. It's going to be a process. It's going to take time and it's going to take a series of steps. They may be short, but they're probably going to be long. And if you care enough about this person, be the fourth P, which is persistent along with patient. And while you're practicing your sober journey and preparing for your sober journey, and you can start to apply those in backwards order, forwards order, whatever order you want to, and all the methods that you found work for you, especially with the preparation for sobriety, right? We always talk about, we say that people spend more time preparing to go to the beach than they do to prepare for sobriety. And so now that you've gone a month or two months or six months or whatever it is, and you start to care about other people and you know that you have some valuable resources from, from you have some valuable resources from channels like this one or books that you've read or other tutorials or other sober coaches or sober inspirational people, whatever it is, you have better tools and you have more that you can share with other people now that you are strong and confident and know that you can handle more than just your, or your own daily struggle with sobriety. All right, moving on to question number 40. The last question of this entire series. Today, I'm having a rough day. How can I get through today? Very simply, believe that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We talked about that earlier in this video. Think about your future self is another suggestion that I'm always gonna make. I always talk about past you, current you, and future you. Think about how you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Just get through today. Go to bed early, self-care, self-love, go to the gym. Yeah, I'm reading off my teleprompter here. <laughs> I'm reading off my laptop here. Uh, I wrote a lot of answers. I'm not gonna speak off the cuff for some of these. Um, so walk until you're tired, talk to a friend, talk to two friends, be open, be honest with them and be honest with yourself. Transparency is something that you're also gonna have to practice, right? There's a lot of new things that you're gonna be practicing. And getting through a rough day is one of the things that you're gonna have to practice. Getting yelled at, hopefully you're not getting yelled at by your boss, but being disciplined in some way, shape or form by whoever you work for is definitely one of the things that are probably gonna set you off, so to speak, or put you in a bad mood. Um, deaths are inevitable. They're gonna happen. You're gonna potentially have to go to a funeral while you're in the infancy stages of your sobriety. You may have to go through a breakup, especially if your partner is increasingly toxic and they don't wish to change. If you want better for yourself, again, like we said, you may have known this person for most of your life. You may have been with this person for 10 years, but it doesn't mean that you have to be with them for another 10 years. And if their goals don't line up with your goals, that is the grounds for breaking up. I've been there. I've been on I've been on the end of somebody not wanting better for themselves, so I had to break up with them. And I've also been on the other end of that where I didn't want better for myself at that time and somebody else did, so they broke up with me. That's what happens in relationships. And that also happens with professional relationships, with friendships, you name it. When it doesn't work out mutually for both parties, it comes to an end. So if you're having a rough day, how do you get through it? Literally everything else that I said. 
get through it however you need to. If you know that sitting on the couch and watching depressed movies when you're depressed is just gonna make you more depressed and it's gonna cause and it's gonna stir up a bunch of depressed and sad emotions and you're not quite ready or capable to handle them, then why do that? You know, it's like, it's very seducing to listen to extremely sad music when we're sad or watch sad movies when we're sad or put ourselves in a sad zone and then disappear for a week or three days or two days or whatever it is and go into this infinite cloud of sadness, right? Or into rage and to act on emotions because when you feel emotion, you wanna tackle it right away, especially when it's anger. I'm not immune to that either, but I also know that I resort to thinking about future self. Future self is just a few minutes away and decisions that we make right now can affect not only our lives, for the rest of our lives, but can also potentially affect somebody else's life for the rest of their lives, however long or short they could potentially be because of how you are, how you act or may potentially act in the very short upcoming moments. So however you act and however you respond to whatever's happening in your life is something that you get more opportunities to practice and you get to make better decisions and you get to be proud of yourself tomorrow. <laughs> you won't be proud of yourself right now, right? Not exactly, but you might be. You might say like, Normally, I would slap them in the face, but I didn't. I still wanna slap them in the face and I still wanna slash their tire and I still wanna put sugar in the gas tank, but I'm not going to because that's the old me. I may have done some of that yesterday, but today I chose differently. <laughs> And we want to make better decisions instead of worse decisions. And we want to have a string of, we want to have a string of consecutive better decisions instead of worse decisions. So if you have to take a nap, take a nap. If you have to take two naps, take two naps. If you have to actually, if you, if you say to yourself, like, oh, I can't sleep, go for a walk, go for a long walk, get yourself tired. And if you end up staying up all night, and I know the last thing that you want to do when you're experiencing painful emotions, sometimes we sleep like, babies when we're super depressed. And sometimes the last thing we could do is fall asleep when we're depressed. But whatever it is that's gonna get you through today, whatever it is that's gonna keep you from drinking or using or abusing or making a decision that's gonna potentially affect the rest of your life or somebody else's life, do whatever you have to do to sit with the emotion. Ask bigger questions. Ask as many questions as you can. Why is this happening? How did we come to this? How do I avoid this in the future? How do I avoid this in the future? But seriously, how do I avoid this in the future? How do I remove this possibility from my life? Because I don't want this anymore. I don't want these things anymore. I don't want these people in my life anymore. I don't want those to be my options for the weekend anymore. I don't want this to be the thing that I do for a living anymore. I don't want this to be the person I wake up to next to. I don't, I don't, I don't want this to be the person I wake up next to anymore. Some things that we can change, some things that we can't change. But one thing that we're always gonna be stuck with and be with is ourselves. So be kind to yourself. Do what you need to do for yourself so that tomorrow you'll have reasons to love yourself and to be proud of yourself and know that life handed you some challenges. And maybe you didn't pass them all, <laughs> but if we got nine out of 10, that's pretty good. That's an A as far as I'm concerned. You know, 99%, you know, payment credit history is also terrible. Uh, <laughs> they want you to pay all of them consecutively, but we're gonna be kind to ourselves. We're gonna be compassionate with ourselves. We're gonna be understanding of what reality is and how life actually affects us. We're gonna be a better version of ourselves. Right now, we're gonna try, we're gonna practice, we're gonna make the attempt. And we may fall, we may wobble, we look, may, we may look a little silly, silly. <laughs> and we may hope that nobody was paying attention and nobody was recording with their phones, we hope. <laughs> but we know and we will know that the past will just be a blur of better decisions because 
we will start to realign and find a better balance within ourselves and we will start to smile a little bit more and we will start to radiate joy and happiness and start to experience innocence again and interest in our hobbies again. And if that sounds appealing to you, I encourage you to stick around. And if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to this channel. Please consider coming to our live streams every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern and Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you wanna take it a step further and go beyond yourself, consider hitting the join button and support our mission to help people just like you and your neighbor and your spouse and whoever else that needs to get sober. That's the work that we're doing here. And I believe that we're doing God's work. And you don't have to do any of that. If all you ever do is watch this video, I want you to know that you're loved and that you're cared about. And it's important to me, whether or not I ever meet you in life and whether or not you ever watch another video, that you become the best version of yourself that you possibly can. And with that, I wanna wish you good luck on your sobriety journey. And I will see you in the next video.